Hello. I must admit I'm confused. I have an increasingly hard time grasping the world that I'm living in. Even though I have ever more powerful informational tools at my disposal. Over the years, I have learned to follow the guidance of the navigation system that came with my phone. And it has been great. Despite my terribly poor sense of orientation, I have managed to find my way easily through cities and places I've never been before. No need for planning ahead or sticking to the route. No need to buy maps, puzzling over how to fold them and pulling them out every five minutes, looking like a dork. Things really have gotten better. But they also got worse. One day, we were traveling by car to a small village high up in the Swiss mountains. This being Switzerland, there are excellent roads to almost everywhere, and the Navi showed a road leading directly to the village. As we drove up, the road got more and more narrow to the point where it was impossible to turn around. And then it ceased to be a road altogether. It turned into a pathway for forestry, seriously pushing the capacities of our definitely not off-road car. Confusion about where the pathway would lead, panic over getting stuck in the middle of what's clearly nowhere now, were mixed with the embarrassment of trusting the device more than our senses and the all too obvious shapes of the landscape around us. It created a form of self-loathing that comes from not being able to decide whether one is affected by or the source of the problem. The most likely cause of the problem was a classic category mistake. One type of road was classified as another, but frankly, it could have been any numbers of reasons. The system might have been hacked, perhaps there was a glitch in the software, perhaps it was designed to hide some military facility or the CEO's villa, perhaps we didn't use the device correctly. In most instances, the cause of such problems is in practice unknowable. But here we were, stuck with only bad options. Do a quick search on GPS accidents, and you will see this is clearly not just my personal problem, but a collective one. And it's not limited to GPS navigation, but we can take it to represent an ever more prevalent experience of our present technocultural condition. Reality is disappearing and reappearing in confusing ways. But obviously, we made it out of the woods. The villagers who knew the different roads and pathways by heart laughed at us. Now I'm asking myself, how did we, as a culture built around ubiquitous digital communication and self-declared smart systems, how did we get there? And what does that tell us for thinking about how we could get out of there again. I can offer two ideas on how we got there, and if they are relevant, they might point towards possible exits. But I cannot offer a map, unfortunately, but neither can your GPS system. So let me start how we got there. There are at least two major developments that are relevant. First, as capitalism expanded, it has created a system of communication that cannot, we heard that, but also does not want to deal with meaning, with very problematic consequences for social life that relies on communication to negotiate shared meaning and to create and navigate the world. Second, as the complexity of the socio-techno-biological connections of society increases, the old ways of organizing knowledge the printed maps, if you will, have become increasingly unable to provide an accurate understanding of the world we're living in. In their place, a new type of knowledge regime is emerging that produces its own form of meaninglessness. In the 1940s, the economist and historian Karl Polanyi developed the idea of a fictitious commodity. And he went on to de 
identify three of them, labor, land, and money. A commodity, he argued, is something that has been produced in order to be sold and bought in the market, and its value fluctuates with the market. If there is no market demand, the commodity will cease to be produced. Now, capitalism is very good at producing commodities, but Polanyi maintained not everything that is necessary for the economy can be produced as a commodity. The economy is always embedded in the larger social and natural environment, and it draws on the resources produced outside of it, outside of the economy. In other words, the economy cannot produce its own preconditions. Labor, a key component in any economic activity, he argued, is inseparable from the fullness of human life. And this life is not created for and by the market, but is an offspring of the fullness of human life itself. To treat human life solely as a commodity, to take its price as labor as the only relevant dimension, is to cut off human life from other dimensions, sociality and purpose, for example, and subsume it fully under the dynamics of the market, with the ultimate consequence that if there is no demand for labor, there should be no human life. The market radicals of the 19th century had the expectation that if we follow this, at some point a grim Malthusian equilibrium would emerge. The same with land. Land, when turned into property or extractive resources, can be sold and bought in the market. And as we know, prices fluctuate quite significantly. But land is nothing but the environment in which we live and to which we are connected in ways so complex that we are only now slowly beginning to understand these connections more fully. When turning nature into a commodity, all these myriads of connections and relations are destroyed and they become replaced by a single one, the price that can be realized in the market. But real estate cannot produce nature, even if a developer plants some trees in a corporate plaza or a golf course inside a gated community. Land and labor are fictitious commodity because human life and the natural environment are not produced by the market. They require far more complex relations to be able to reproduce themselves. Destroying all these relationships by insisting on the market relationship as the only relevant one is ultimately leading to the destruction of both human life and the natural environment. Polanyi called the market society, one that is organized exclusively around market relationship, as envisioned by his compatriot Friedrich von Hayek, a stark utopia. Stark utopia in the sense of a vision that cannot exist. And seeking to realize this impossible dream threatens to annihilate the very complexity necessary for the existence of human life and the natural environment. Now, with social media, I would argue, contemporary capitalism has produced a fourth type of fictitious commodity, engagement. Engagement, according to the first definition Google pointed me to, and I quote here the consultant with the best search engine optimization strategy, so I must be a good consultant, simply means getting your fans to do something in response to your post. Like, comment, click to open picture, click on link. These are all forms of engagement. Each time one of these things is done, Facebook specifically measures it. And not only that, but it becomes more popular, and on Facebook, more people will see that post." End of quote. In other words, engagement is any reaction in response to a stimulus. This reaction is measured, and like all numbers, it can be optimized, and in this case, increased. And the purpose of social media, the entire technological infrastructure, all their activities are geared towards producing and selling engagement. Under the imperative of capitalism, this means to continuously produce more of it. And they have gotten really good at it. I'm quite sure a few of us are producing it right now. But like land and labor, engagement is just a small aspect of something much larger, communication. 
Communication, like human life and nature, is a complex and shifting system. There are infinite ways to say something and infinite ways to understand something and infinite ways to go back and forth trying to match what has been said to what has been understood. The core of this communication is the establishment of meaning, which is always relational and unstable. And communication as meaning, precisely because of its contextuality and subjectivity, cannot be measured. It is not discrete. Communication, the never-ending negotiation of meaning, both relation, uh, rational and effective, is a fundamental element of social life for establishing and adjusting the sense of self and other, with whom and with what one can be together and what it means to be together. An engagement is only a byproduct of communication. Reacting to something is a means towards something else, not an end in itself. To turn social communication into the fictitious commodity of measurable engagement means to disembed the acts of communication from the complexity of producing meaning and embed it into an environment in which only its commodity aspect counts. All the rest is discounted. Communication is reduced to the most behaviorist dimension, a pattern of stimulus and response. But it's even more radical than the founder of behaviorism, B.F. Skinner, would have thought in the 1940s and 50s, because it has been married to the econom economic demands of producing more and more. Thus, part of our disorientation, our driving down the stairs and into the ditch, comes from communicating through systems that have been created and are continuously optimized for the commodity of engagement. It's not entirely impossible to create meaning that is shared understanding through social mass media, but it happens as a byproduct and is counteracted all the time by the platform relentless orientation to increase engagement irrespective of meaning. This is quite simply driving people crazy, a state of mind from which they protect themselves with conspiracy theories. But this is only one source of the problem, one of the reasons why we end up driving down the stairs. Another source is the deep epistemological crisis in at, in at least the applied sciences, that is, in the currently most consequential way of knowing about the world. This crisis comes from the fact that the complexity of the problems that science, and with science politics, is dealing now has sharply increased. The last time this happened in Europe was with the influx of the new knowledges about the natural and cultural worlds following the first wave of colonization. An influx which helped spark the scientific revolution of the 17th century, as we heard yesterday. Now, as it was the case then, there is an explosion in the number of actors, more and more diverse human, biological, and technological actors that need to be accounted for. And to make things worse, an even greater explosion in the number of relationships between these actors whose interactions need to be taken into consideration. Virtually any problem, but particularly the very fundamental ones such as climate change, can no longer be thought of as knowledge objects in front of us with clear demarcations, but are now seen as sprawling networks around us. And like all networks, they have areas of increased densities, but no real boundaries. And even the weakest of links can turn out to affect the entire network. More importantly, the observer is most often a node in the network itself. And from every node, there is only a partial view of the network, and every node has a slightly different one. This makes it impossible to maintain some of the core stances of modern science. One of them is reductionism, that is the claim that one can isolate a few relevant relationships and ignore all the rest and still describe the problem accurately. This is the famous Cateris paribus, all things being equal clause, introduced to the English, into the English language in 1662 two years after the foundation of the Royal Society, so we again in the 17th century. In such an approach, you will remove what appears as weak links from the picture 
But what if this weak link turns out to be the most relevant one? The second core claim of science is the claim of distance and disinterestedness. The argument that the observer is not affecting the observation and that the result of the observation does not affect the observer. This is clearly not the case when every analysis becomes a prescription for, a for action to affect the problem and the different courses of actions have massive reper repercussions on the social system which produces the knowledge. Finally, the claim of objectivity or more mildly intersubjectivity. The claim that the position of the observer doesn't matter and hence that different people from different points of view can observe the same thing, has been subjected to a long and thorough critique at least since the 1970s. The long history of this critique shows that the crisis of epistemology is not entirely new. What is new is that we have now a new technological infrastructure from which to generate a very different knowledge regime. Machine-driven analysis of large data sets, and this is not really about intelligence, but more generally about machine-driven analysis of large data sets is introducing a new way of knowing. In this, it is answering to the crisis of modern science while at the same time deepening it. This is the case even if machine-driven analysis works according to, the diff to its own program. Thus, I will ignore the practical issues of quality of data, issues of modeling, and so on. Kate Crawford and Trevor Pagland will at least in part, speak about that later. The claim to be, able to be able to process large quantities of unstructured data can be seen as avoiding the problem of reductionism, rather than to, to rely on small sample sizes or a controlled laboratory environment or theory-driven hypothesis. The new promise is to take in all data without any prior separation of important from the unimportant aspects of the problem. This separation is now done through machine learning and the less assumption goes into the process, the higher is the chance of finding something new. Yet the opacity and complexity of the tools of analysis reintroduces the problem of replicability with a vengeance. Because the problem of reductionism has now turned into a more fundamental problem of method, the very core of science itself. By focusing on relations that work, the questions are continuously adapted until they lead a statistically significant answer. The value of these answers lies in their utilitarian effect, that is, in the capacity to accurately map the short term rather than in revealing some fundamental causations. Machine-driven analysis dispenses with the notion of a disinterested search for an external truth and fully concentrates on relationships that can be manipulated for predetermined ends. The researchers who are doing the analysis, and this is most clearly in the case of the social media company, are a core element of the situation they are analyzing. And since they are inside the problem rather than outside of it, the results of the analysis can immediately be fed back into the situation, changing its composition and dynamics, making in effect the analysis unrepeatable and hence unfalsifiable. From the point of view of the institutions doing the research, this is not a bug, this is a feature. This is how they learn about the world and the constitutive role in it by tweaking parameters. This goes beyond a move from causation with an explanatory value to correlation with a predictive value. The goal of the knowledge processes is no longer prediction at all, but in some ways it's opposite. It's about preemption. The standard test of, val of validating scientific claim has always been does it allow to predict what will happen under particular circumstances? Now the goal is to be able to intervene in order to change what's happening. On an epistemological level, the shift from a distant knowledge towards an involved manipulation, towards feeding knowledge directly back into the environment in order to see how it is affected by it, is perhaps 
an adequate reaction to the sharp rise in complexity of the problems that defy an outside view, predictions, uncertainty. But, and this is a very significant but, underlying this turn towards preemption is not the cautionary ethics of a risk society, but the neoliberal drive towards endless optimization. So what is prevented is a future that is not tweaked according to the agenda of those seeking this type of knowledge. So where does it leave us? If we return to Polanyi's argument, it would suggest that we need what he called a protective movement that fights against this reduction of communication to engagement. Like the labor movement has always fought against the reduction of human life to labor, and the environmental movement has been fighting against the reduction of nature to land. The fight against the reduction of communication to engagement could mean to force the large companies to acknowledge that they need meaningful communication but cannot produce it themselves. Hence, they need to support the complexity of communication that lies outside their domain, outside the market. We have a model for that. It's called public broadcast. While the established institutions of public broadcasting have their own quite serious problems that they need to address themselves, the basic principle that a democratic society needs sources of information and ways of communicating that are independent from both the market and government could easily be applied to digital communication as well. There is enough money around. Money is clearly not the problem. The social media companies are fantastically profitable and it's time they contribute to the ecosystem from which they extract their commodities. So how could that be done? The neoliberal answer would be paying users individually for their data. But this is, maybe we, we can talk about this later, a really nonsensical idea that would make the problem worse. Rather, they should pay per user into, say, a fund from which public interest communi in communication, environment, and productions are funded. And the public interest, in the public interest act those who understand communication as social meaning, created through useful con controversies and collective decision-making. After all, this is what democracy is about, making disagreement productive. It is not about eliminating disagreement. It's not about finding the most efficient solution. And it's definitely not about producing meaningless engagement to be tallied up in the bottom line. The second problem, the second source of our confusion, the epistemological crisis in making knowledge claims is much more complex. As I said, involved manipulation feeding knowledge directly back into the environment in order to see how it is affected by it can be an adequate reaction to the sharp rise in complexity. If we cannot predict the long term, we have to act incrementally in the short term and observe the results self-critically. The problem here is that there are only very few actors with very narrow agendas that can do this. Thus, there is a need to broaden the range of actors involved in the process. This does not mean just more people with more diverse agendas, but also new forms of actors, biological as well as technological, with their own particular affordances. And there is a lot of progress in this area, even if the instances are small and often disconnected. One of the examples of progress in this area that impressed me in particular. In March 2017, the Vanagui River in New Zealand was given its own legal identity with the rights, duties, and liability of a legal person. This brought litigation to a happy end which started with a petition to Parliament in 1873. So it took about 150 years for this kind of traditional view of the river as a living system with its own identity to be formally recognized. But it shows that there are ways to recognize and formally acknowledge 
and give legal reality to different types of agencies and different forms of existence. And in this per perspective, the image of the car stuck on the stairs can also be read in hopeful ways, not as a failure of communication and information, not as a source of confusion and self-loathing, but as a very successful expansion of the range of communicative actors. Here, the stairs start to speak very loudly and clearly, so much so that they make themselves heard against all the digital information flows. No matter how many resources Google may find which questions whether stairs exist at all, no matter in what psychologically optimized tone of voice the navigation system admonishes to keep on driving, it is very li likely that the voice of the stairs will overpower them all. Thank you. <laughs>